So I thought I'd just make a little introduction. I've done the sound check. Um, I'm just going to introduce the three of us and then I will sit down. My name is Matt Green. I'm the blockchain litigation lead at a, at a firm called uh, Shoesmiths. Uh, I worked on a seminal case uh, a few years ago called AA and Persons Unknown, actually with uh, Dara here and uh, Chainalysis, who Peter represents. Uh, it set the precedent around the world, well, in common law jurisdictions, that crypto assets were property, so that's Bitcoin and everything else, which has led to a swathe of other cases around the world. Uh, it involved the tracing of a ransom that was paid uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, since then, uh, I've been working with others to build a catalogue of high court judgments in the UK, and I've helped develop best, proof, best proven practices in tracing recovery, including, uh, sorry, uh, including tracing and recovering misappropriated assets. So I'll pass over to Peter. Lastly, oh, there's one microphone. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Peter Janoskins. I'm a solution architect for Chainalysis, so I'm probably the only person in the room that has nothing to do with law or lawyers or anything. Um, so as a solution architect for Chainalysis, I'm basically a relatively technical person in the sales team. So I know how our software works. I do a lot of demos, a lot of talking at conferences, uh, helping uh, customers uh, achieve value with the software. So I'll be talking a bit about how our software works and how you can trace uh, cryptocurrencies through all kinds of systems until it gets to an exchange where you can send a subpoena and figure out who is who, but we'll talk about that later. Dara? Yeah, uh, my name is Dara Connell. I'm a barrister in London. Uh, I'm practicing from Maitland Chambers in Lincoln's Inn, for those who know it. And I've been working, I suppose, in civil fraud for the best part of 10 years. And probably for the last three or four, I've been working on crypto cases. And of course, fraud and crypto go hand in hand. Uh, and I've worked with Matt and, and Chainalysis as well in relation to that. And hopefully, this session is going to be reasonably interactive. I'm conscious of the fact we didn't have a coffee break in advance. So if I see people snoring away, we won't take it personally at this point in time. But. Um, Peter, I think you were going to kick off in terms of... Um, I thought you were going to do the... Oh, I'm going to do... Oh, no, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so, yeah. What we're going to do today is, is broadly break this up into three. So <laughs> Peter is going to give a uh, very helpful um, summary with the benefit of a presentation on what chain analysis do. And having spoken to a few people over the coffee break, I think it's very important to understand how... Uh, crypto assets are traced on the blockchain, and Chainalysis is the world leading provider of the relevant software that assists with that and assists both law enforcement and individual lawyers and law firms. Um, then I'm going to give a bit of an overview just about where we are in the UK in terms of some of the developments, and I think it actually is notable the last panel dealing with the fact that um, quite clearly there is an awful lot of data harvesting out there, and the legal principles are slowly but surely catching up with the technological developments. And then Matt and I, I think, are going to answer a whole range of questions from Peter about how you practically deal with a case where you are instructed on behalf of somebody who's been the victim of crypto fraud. Uh, and hopefully we'll provide um, some analysis in relation to that, but also because Matt and I are both practicing in the courts in England, um, it'll be probably UK law focused, but I'm conscious there are a lot of people from common law jurisdictions here today, and many of the principles we'll be discussing presumably can be applied by analogy to your local jurisdictions. So Peter, your turn to kick off. Okay, right, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna assume not everybody knows what blockchains are and what cryptocurrencies are. So um, in a rough overview, Blockchains are a decentralized way to store all kinds of transactions. And these transactions are all publicly readable, but you don't know what is what. It's like having a complete list of all the phone calls that have happened over like the last year, but you only have the numbers. So you only see this number calling that number. On the blockchain, you see this number sending money to that number. And as an extra complication, every time you choose a phone and you, you phone somebody up, you get a new, new phone number. So in the on most of these blockchains, people will have a lot of addresses. After each transaction, they will have new addresses. So what Chainalysis is, we are basically the uh, white pages of the cryptocurrency blockchains. So we will tell you these addresses belong to an exchange called Binance, or these addresses belong to a scammer website or a fraud shop. We do not care about individual people, like the white pages or the yellow pages also just have companies. 
We have companies, we know about 15,000 companies on the blockchains. We don't care about your personal wallet. Your personal wallet comes into play once you're an interesting person and these people, the lawyers, want to find who's behind this address. They will then trace the money from the address until it's at an exchange. And cryptocurrency exchanges are where you can uh, change your fiat money into cryptocurrency money. To be able to do that, you will have to make an account and you will have to put like a scan of your passport there and you will have to prove who you are. So the exchanges, the cryptocurrency exchanges, they are the ones that have the link between the cryptocurrency addresses and the real life person. So this is where we come in. Um, so there's basically um, two types of recovering cryptocurrencies, two, two ways how this can go. So um, cryptocurrency, uh, so uh, scenario number one is basically you have a cryptocurrency address and you want to follow the money and you want to seize the funds if possible, so give it back to the victim. So in, in that case, in, in scenario number one, you're basically following the money uh, until it's at the money ends up at an exchange, and then you contact that exchange and you say, okay, uh, you're, you currently have this amount of Bitcoin coming from illegal proceeds. Would you please freeze those funds and not uh, convert that to fiat and send that to this, this client of yours? So that's one way to do this. And then there's scenario number two where people have not got their money at an exchange. So uh, with cryptocurrencies, you can decide to have your money at an exchange, let's say a bank account, uh, uh, at, least, at least that's the equivalent, or you can have it at home. You can have a private wallet, which can be a piece of software on your phone or your computer, or it can even be like a USB stick. So then nobody has controls over your funds, just yourself. It's like having a very large amount of cash in your mattress, right? So in that case, what you do is uh, you follow the money or you, you find a link between this money and an exchange where it came from or where some of the money went to. You ask this exchange for who is this person, you send a subpoena there, who's behind this little address, which you can link to the bigger amount of address, uh, the bigger amount of money that's hosted um, offsite. Once you know that person, you send law enforcement in and they might have a, a house visit. They then find this cryptocurrency wallet or they find the the, the, the password to the cryptocurrency, and they can then take this wallet or this password away and then seize the funds and transfer it into a secure location. So what, is, what, what might something like this look like? Okay, so in this case, law enforcement or yourself, you're uh, looking at a, a telegram group or an exchange, an exchange between two suspects, and somebody puts this number in there. That is just a very large number that has, you have no clue what it is but it could be a cryptocurrency address. Normally, this is all you have. If you were to go online to what's called a block explorer, you could put the address in, and you could see how much money is in the address, and you could see the transfers for this address. But, like I said before, that's the only thing you can see, and the transfers just go to other addresses like this. So you have no clue what's what. This is where Chain Analysis comes in, our software. So we know who is who on the blockchains. So you can put this number, uh, this address into a Chainalysis Reactor, which is one of our tools, and it will tell you, okay, this address is at an exchange. I don't know if it's possible to see my mouse cursor here. So over here, is that being, it's not being presented, sorry. Anyway, you can see that this address is not just a random address, it's an address at an exchange. So this belongs to an exchange. This is somebody's account on a cryptocurrency exchange. So, but, um, there's a lot of addresses on the exchange. Or some of the exchanges have like 250 million addresses. Uh, you want to extract this address to see what's happening to this specific one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this specific address out of the 250 million exchange addresses. Basically, on the blockchain, like I said, it's just numbers. So how does an exchange keep track of whose money belongs to who? It's basically like a, like a bank. You have your own deposit number. You have your own bank account. On the blockchain, everybody has their own deposit on an exchange. So if money is coming into the exchange, it's coming into an address. For the exchange to be able to know if it's my money, Dara's money, or Matt's money, that it comes into a certain uh, exchange to call a deposit address. So we take the address out of the exchange, and then we see who else is sending money into this address, and what are the source of funds for this address. So in this case, I think our money is coming from a scam. Um, you can see that on the right side of the screen, you see this pizza, right? Uh, this pizza has a specific color. It's dark brown. 
in, in our software, all the specific categories like scam, exchanges, darknet markets, they all have specific colors. In this case, this case, this guy is getting most of his money from dark brown, which is bad. So he's receiving money from a scam site. So he's maybe it's an investment scam, maybe it's uh, uh, doing something else. But this guy is basically getting illegal money. So we might then want to find out, okay, what else is being sent into this address? So you can see this little two arrows into this address. You can find out what else and where else money is coming from, what is the other source of funds for this person. And then if you want to figure out where the money actually came from, we said scam, but you might want to figure out which scam it is. You can use the graphing tool to track the funds through all kinds of wallets. And then in this case, you can see that it starts out with the scam cluster on the far left. It goes through a few private wallets, and then it ends up at this deposit address at the exchange. So that's what we do. We know who is who. We know which addresses belong together, and we identify addresses as being exchanges, scam, ransomware, and other types of funds. So I hope that's a, a quick intro in what we do. Then we'll now continue with some of the questions that these guys can answer. <clears throat> so let's first talk about uh, crypto asset recovery from a perspective of lawyers. Um, Dara. Can you give an overview of the typical challenges faced by lawyers acting for a victim of crypto fraud? Yeah, um, thanks very much. And I'm sure some of you have dealt with um, people who have been the most fortunate uh, victims of this type of fraud, which is particularly egregious. The first thing to note is the, the scale we're dealing with. Uh, the US Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, estimated uh, in June of this year that since 2021, they'd been contacted by 46,000 people who'd been defrauded, the equivalent of $1 billion. Uh, Chainalysis in the 2022 crime report, which is well worth a read, uh, indicated that cryptocurrency theft had risen 516% since 2020, and that effectively what was estimated to be 3.2 billion worth of crypto assets had been misappropriated. As crypto has become more and more accepted as a uh, transfer of value, and irrespective of really what you think about that, uh, fraud has, has grown exponentially as well. And uh, those who were referred to in the previous talk, be it state actors, be it organized criminal gangs, uh, or, or just plain fraudsters have used the growth in crypto to defraud thousands and hundreds of thousands of people out of uh, crypto assets. Uh, it's notable that that scale is matched by the fact that many of the legal tools that you would ordinarily use have not yet quite been adapted to deal with this level of fraud. And uh, the first thing to note as a challenge for lawyers when one uh, has a client who's walked through the door saying, I've been defrauded out of my one Bitcoin or my you know, three tether or whatever it is, is, is cost. It is very costly at the moment to take uh, enforcement action by way of legal process as a consequence of, of crypto fraud. You need to have an expert on board, someone who ideally uses chain analysis software or equivalent software and has the ability to trace where the fraud proceeds have ended up. The other feature, in addition to the obvious costs of lawyers, etc., is the fact that the relevant victim of fraud needs to have acted reasonably quickly. It is not uncommon for uh, the proceeds of the fraud to be moved very, very quickly. Uh, and as a consequence of which, someone who arrives and says, well, two and a half years ago, I've been defrauded. There are difficulties there, helpfully, that's where the blockchain analysis comes in. Because what you want to do is take the analysis that Peter talked you through and find links between the wallet that was used to misappropriate funds or end up with the proceeds of a fraud and various other wallets and actually build up a picture of generally a fraudulent network. And that's very important in relation to things. Uh, and, and the final challenge, I suppose, just generally in relation to this is both lawyers uh, judges, jurists, etc. We are all trying to get up to speed with the technological developments. And the technology is moving so quickly 
uh, that, quite frankly, many of the legal processes are simply too clunky, too difficult to deal with. Uh, there is a paucity of regulation uh, at the moment. Uh, it would appear that most uh, regulators are waiting on each other to take the first step regarding crypto. Uh, and we, as lawyers who deal with commercial litigation and civil fraud, uh, need to use existing tools, often, in our case, in the common law, and adapt them accordingly. So those are the challenges, really, in relation to uh, immediate issues. Um, uh, thanks, Dara. Um, are there any other types of legislation that are likely to involve crypto assets? Yeah, you know, I do a mix of comlet and civil fraud. And what's notable is where really the growth initially in the last 18 months to 24 months has been in relation to crypto fraud. Um, increasingly, I'm seeing clients who come to me, um, generally I'm instructed by solicitors' firms, who, who effectively say, well, hold on, we invested in a fintech business and payment was going to be made in crypto. Uh, how do we deal with that situation where one party defaults on the contractual agreement? Uh, the art world has been completely transformed by NFTs. And again, irrespective of what you think of an NFT, uh, quite frankly, there are significant sums of money being transferred to transfer digital assets. That requires a contract. There is the innovation of smart contracts and indeed blockchain technology generally uh, to deal with these types of uh, transfers of assets. But inevitably, there will be commercial disputes. One area to touch upon, of course, is, is in relation to insolvency as well. It is not unusual uh, for directors or other fiduciaries of companies that are about to enter into insolvency processes to dissipate assets. And notably, for those who were reading the FT over the weekend, you would have seen that the uh, owner of Celsius is purported to have dissipated $10 million shortly before the insolvency of that particular uh, crypto network. And it's alleged at the moment, of course, in relation to things, but um, insolvency practitioners are very carefully looking at crypto in relation to when people can move assets quite quickly and substantially. And very finally, of course, in matrimonial uh, proceedings, matrimonial finance, um, a person's crypto assets need to be declared as, as part of their assets and income. And uh, again, one would expect that we will slowly over the next uh, two to five years see an awful lot of litigation in areas that are somewhat unexpected. And I should also point out that the English courts have recently recognised that digital assets can form the subject matter of trust, a case called Wang and Darley. So trust practitioners, again, will need to be dealing with the concept of digital assets forming the subject matter of trust. And all of those things will inevitably feed through into different areas of law. So just because you're not a fraud lawyer, that doesn't mean that crypto and digital assets generally won't have a bearing on the way in which litigation is conducted. Oh, thanks, Sarah. So uh, let's talk about developments in the UK court. Uh, so now that we understand the issue a bit, uh, how have the UK courts uh, approached crypto assets? Yeah, so one of the things I think Matt has already touched upon is some of the developments uh, in the commercial court in England and Wales regarding digital assets. And that's largely led by the current master of the roles, Geoffrey Voss, who chaired an uh, extrajudicial panel called the UK Jurisdiction Task Force to address the issue of digital assets. Uh, and effectively, the panel um, which he appointed recommended that English law should recognise digital assets as property under English law. Now, I'm aware other jurisdictions have done um, something similar. Um, likewise, there are difficulties with defining a digital asset as property. Traditionally, English law recognises two forms of property, chooses an action, or, uh, which uh, uh, effectively are uh, debt claims or claims for a breach of contract, something that requires a legal um, process, or alternatively chooses in possession, an asset that one possesses. Now, the whole nature of a digital asset on a distributed ledger uh, is one that's not readily fit within either of those two definitions. Um, in a case which Matt has mentioned, which he instructed me, we, we obtained the first order from the English High Court uh, which effectively endorsed what the UK Jurisdiction Task Force had recommended, 
That is to say, we were able to obtain a proprietary injunction over digital assets that had formed the subject matter of a ransomware attack. I'm aware from the previous panel as well that much discussion has been um, had regarding the payments of ransoms. Uh, in England and Wales, uh, law firms have become a target for ransomware attacks. And uh, in our particular case, we acted on behalf of an anonymized insurer, and that insurer had paid a ransom uh, to effectively facilitate the release of um, software and indeed um, documentation that had been the subject of a malware attack. Uh, what ultimately ended up happening is that we were able, using tech, uh, technology from Chainalysis, to trace where 96 Bitcoin of the 100 that had been paid in ransom had ended up, and we were able to obtain orders in respect of that relevant wallet, which was held with a, an exchange called Bitfinex. Um, the long and short of it is, um, in finding that digital assets constitute property uh, under English law, it affords victims of fraud the potential to rely on the quite strong English legal protections for property uh, and to obtain fairly wide-ranging relief, including proprietary injunctions, worldwide freezing orders over digital assets on the blockchain. And that has been somewhat revolutionary in the sense that it has been followed by a whole host of cases. And at the moment, in the London Circuit Commercial Court, um, there is effectively a digital asset dispute before that court on a pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, people invariably going in and obtaining injunctions without notice quickly um, and really utilizing some of the legal precedents that have been set really in the last 24 months or so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, so let's move on to some pre-action. Uh, I understand that there are certain points a victim of fraud would want to consider before cl bringing a claim in England, the first being jurisdiction. So what questions do you need to consider when looking at jurisdiction? Um, hi, everybody again. Can I just get a show of hands? Does anybody own any crypto assets at all? That's okay. That's actually better than I thought it was going to be. And is anybody not from Holland? Anybody from a different country? Okay. Because this, this is a question that we have to ask ourselves when we deal with crypto assets is jurisdiction, where do we start? So the first is, is where does your client reside or, or where are they from? So if they are English, then that helps me as an English lawyer, I can start the claim in England. There's another question as to where the assets are. And with crypto assets, it can be quite difficult to determine where those assets are. There was a case uh, recently, well, there have been several cases which have determined that the lex situs of crypto assets are where they reside or, or there is debate as to where they're domiciled. And there's a bit of an argument at the moment um, as to which one is correct. Um, it's also worth considering whether the exchange that the crypto funds have been found at have any establishment in England. So if we think about it, we need to apply to a court on the basis that we're going to go after um, exchanges and we're going to ask them for certain disclosure orders and we'll get to that but also we need to understand the victim so the victim is sort of question number one and if we're going to injunct exchanges they need to have some establishment in england as well being an english lawyer so we need to uh, figure out a way to get them into the jurisdiction so jurisdiction is step number one okay the next step is then evidence uh once somebody provides you with a forensic tracing report what are some of the points you need to consider Okay, so this is, this is super important because you get a tracing report um, from somebody and it says, uh, for example, 100 Bitcoin has been stolen or lost, misappropriated, whatever it is, and you need to look at the flow of funds, where have they ended up? Now, if it's gone one hop across the blockchain to an exchange, that makes it very straightforward because you know exactly where they've gone. But what happens if it's broken up into many different transactions or gone through some kind of washing machine? That makes it much more difficult to follow. So it may be that actually, out of 100, you're able to locate 80 of them. You also need to consider what uh, asset that they, are, they have been transferred into. You might have started in Bitcoin, and you followed the assets along the blockchain, or their proceeds, and you end up with an asset that isn't worth anything anymore. I mean, if you, if you invested in Terra, or it got transferred into Terra, you might not be so lucky. And I know Tether's going through some interesting things at the moment. So you just need to consider the commercial points on whether you're going to uh, trace the money and what that money looks like. Okay, can you also tell me about pre-action correspondence and why that's helpful? 
So on the basis that you're acting quickly, you might go, well, why are we bothering with pre-action correspondence? We should go straight to court and get an injunction. Um, imagine this, you go to court, you get an injunction, and the exchange, who you're about to injunct, goes, well, I would have just frozen it if you'd have just written to me. Now, of course, in my experience, that hasn't happened, but I think you need to go through those processes because a judge will probably tear you or someone like Dara, who's in front of him, um, apart for doing that. So it's part of the process. I think as well, it makes sure that the exchange knows not to move funds. You write to them and you say, these funds that you now hold are the proceeds of crime. Please do not move them. If they do move them, then there may, there may well be a case against the exchange. I think lastly, it's important to write to them because at least then you know if you get a response that that's the correct email address and correspondence details that you need when service occurs. Okay, so you're writing to an exchange. What does the pre-action correspondence include then? So when you write to the exchange, you need to include a story of what's happened, so the basic details, who your victim is, what had happened, essentially the factual matrix. Um, you need to include the depositing and withdrawing addresses so that they can see the, uh, the, the exchange, that the addresses belong uh, to their, uh, I suppose, their world. Um, if you... If I write to, say, Kraken and, and provide them with a wallet address, they may say, well, that wallet address isn't one of ours. What are you doing? So you need to make sure that you provide as much information as you can on tracing. You need to include notices from Proceeds of Crime Act, um, especially in our jurisdiction, to ensure that um, they understand that they have been put on notice. Um, you need to put a request in to ensure that um, you... Sorry. You need to put a, a request in um, to ensure that things are frozen. So if you've traced a certain amount, say 100 Bitcoin to an exchange, you need to ask for them to freeze it. Um, you also need to ask for information from the person who ended up with the funds um, and request not to tip them off. And probably include a short deadline to do all of that as well. Thanks for that. Um, let's move on to applications for inju injunctions and disclosure orders. Uh, so when you make an application to an English court, can you tell us who the respondents are? Yeah, so this is important to consider. You need to think about who exactly you're going after. So, uh, respondent one is going to be the person who defrauded your client, and we may not know exactly who they are, we may do. It may be a category of person, it may be a company in a foreign jurisdiction, but we just need to understand who they are. Respondent two are the parties, and we don't know who they are yet, who ended up with the funds. So if you look at the tracing report, you'll see where the funds started and where they ended. It's, it's those people who we're interested in. Afterwards, you have to include all of the relevant entities of the exchanges. So if you think that we're trying to get information from exchanges at the end to find out who the individuals are behind Category 2, you need to make sure that you include all the relevant um, uh, parties there. Okay, so now you have the respondents. Um, what orders do you apply for? Yes, this will be subject to the specifics of the case, but broadly speaking, you know, one of the first things you're going to be looking at is privacy. Uh, there is very, very little point in telling the fraudsters that you are applying for an urgent high court injunction. Uh, they will simply move the assets as quickly as possible. So these types of applications are made without notice to the other side. That gives rise in English law to an obligation of full and frank disclosure. So you're required to effectively set out all, warts and all, uh, what your case is in advance. Um, you want an order that the hearing itself takes place in private. Uh, again, under English law, there is a very important principle of open justice, so you, it's a derogation from that principle. And normally judges, in cases involving hot pursuit of misappropriated assets, are willing to sit in private for the first hearing. Uh, they won't sit in private once the order's been made. It's very difficult for them to do so. But in order for you to have the maximum chance of obtaining those assets at the end of this process, you need to uh, go without giving any hints away, effectively, to have the benefit of surprise in relation to it. In terms of actually what you then want to achieve, um, well, you most certainly want a uh, proprietary injunction over um, the traced assets, assuming you have been able to trace them on the blockchain. Um, as part of that, you may well want permission to adduce expert evidence. So you will need your expert report to be compliant with the relevant procedural rules for an expert in your relevant jurisdiction. Um, in addition, uh, Matt mentioned already, you want what's called a banker's trust order in English law, maybe called a disclosure order or 
disclosure against third parties in your own jurisdictions, but effectively it's an order directed to the exchanges uh, who, I suppose for those unfamiliar with um, transactions involving crypto assets, perhaps it's useful to consider them almost as banks in, in that sense. They're not really banks and they're certainly not regulated as such but they hold uh, and should hold know your customer material, KYC information, that enables you to obtain an order requiring them to disclose what is the specifics as regards this, this particular wallet, who owns it or who purportedly owns it, uh, what is the KYC information, are there any linked bank accounts to that particular wallet, um, and the long and short of it is, you want to use the information from the exchange to extract as much helpful information as possible to build up a picture of who your fraudster is. At the start, it's against persons unknown. You don't know who this particular fraudster is, and, and generally, as I say, it's quite an organized group. But what you want to do is obtain an order from the court that enables you to go to an exchange and say, I have been the victim of fraud, or my client has been the victim of fraud, and as a consequence of this particular order, you are obliged to hand over X, Y, Z pieces of information. And that's absolutely critical. The final aspect of the piece is, of course, you need permission to serve these documents. And how do you serve persons unknown? Well, the English courts have come up with a whole range of different innovative ways that enable you to affect service by WhatsApp message, by NFT in a recent case, by email, if that's available, or alternatively, to require that the exchanges affect service on behalf of the claimant because they are the ones who have uh, the information. It's also critically important that service is affected as quickly as possible because you want to be able to freeze those assets before they move. And this all generally takes place in a hell of a rush. Uh, certainly Matt and I have done these things where you know, you're working through the night over the course of 24, 48 hours to get this over the line as quickly as possible, to have a hearing on a Saturday morning or a Friday evening or whatever it is. It's dreadful for the social life, but such is the way. But, but the long and short of it is speed is critical because if you delay at that point in time, there's, you know, there is a, a very strong likelihood that effectively the crypto assets will be exchanged or off-ramped for fiat currency. So you want to avoid that happening because ultimately the advantage of the blockchain technology from the perspective of a fraud lawyer is it's money with memory. You can tell where it's been, where it goes, where it is. As soon as it enters into the cash system, it is much harder to trace, much harder to track. And actually, for fraudsters, it's not a particularly effective mechanism because, as I say, it is possible to track the movements um, using the right technology. So can you give us an indication how much work that actually is for the lawyers? Uh, yeah. Oh, that one's off. Maybe you can hear me. Yeah. So um, it is quite a lot of work. I used to have hair at the start of, of working on this, and now I don't. Um, so that's, that, that's an indication. My, my mark says that I had hair on this. It was a few years ago. But anyway, um, so you have to put an affidavit together. So not just a witness statement in, in UK, it's an affidavit, which means it needs to be sworn, and that's because you're doing uh, an, an interim uh, application. Um, what that means is you normally have one from the client explaining the story, so what happened to them, how did they get defrauded, and another one from a lawyer like me, which essentially explains the basis for the application and what you're doing. Um, just to run through the forms, it's an application form, a claim form, and of course you'll have your expert evidence from these guys to make sure that um, the evidence has come from um, somewhere proper. Right. Um, in terms of loss, do you put the amount in crypto or a fiat uh, equivalent? Um, it depends. I think we're going to come to this later, so I'll keep this, this very brief. But it really depends on people's appetites, the price of crypto at the time, um, and what the assets are. But I, I, I'm very conscious we're uh, moving quite uh, we, well. We've got quite a lot to cover, so we'll come back to that later. Okay. How do you affect servers on the exchanges? Uh, I think, as Dara said earlier, uh, you can do it by email, NFT, all sorts. Um, and again, I, I think Dara's covered that nicely. Okay. Well, let's continue to the return dates and the evidence following disclosure. Um, if the judge grants you the relief, then what happens? Um, hopefully, you'll receive a shed load of documents and information. So the exchanges will provide you with the identities of the individuals who own the funds that have been uh, traced to them. So you'll get passport information, 
uh, email addresses, telephone numbers, so hopefully you know who the individual is. But it goes a little bit beyond that. Then you get uh, transaction IDs and hashes to understand what money has come in and out, uh, in what currency. You get IP addresses, mobile phone data, and you can start to paint a picture of who these individuals are. Um, once you get all that information, then it may be useful to hand it over to an investigator who can start to understand where these people are, what jurisdiction they're in, um, and see if there's a link to the individual fraud. Now, the only other thing I would say here is that lawyers need to serve those individuals. So before we had persons unknown, we had absolutely no idea who these people were. Now we know who they are, and we have to serve them with all those documents. And again, it can be by email, NFT, depending on what the court ordered. Right, so uh, you got these category two defendants, and you served the respondents with all the papers and all the orders. What would be the next step? Well, I think the reality is you'll probably be required to go back to court. So bear in mind you've obtained your order without notice to anyone you've just shown up. And the judge, certainly in England, will say you've got to affect service and then come back and have an argument to figure out whether that order um, was the correct order to make and whether the court is prepared to continue the injunction. Um, in English law, what will often happen in that type of situation is the order will be slightly amended. One notable amendment is you're going to name everyone you've uh, found out their identity. And from my experience, some will attend court, some will uh, seek representation from English solicitors, Others who may well be participants in the fraud will decline to do both. Uh, they may correspond directly with the claimant victim of the fraud. It is not unusual in these types of situations for uh, offers to pay uh, digital assets being made to your um, claimant victim. Um, it is also quite common that people may well come up and say, well, I'm a bona fide third party. I didn't know anything about the fraud. I was involved in a bona fide transaction. Uh, I simply exchanged my tether for Bitcoin and I've ended up with some of your client's money, but I had no notice of any of that. And that provides a defense under English law uh, of a bona fide purchaser for value without notice of the fraud. Um, that is why it is absolutely critical to obtain the right information from the exchanges. Because if you're in a position to, for example, look for the IP addresses uh, that were used to um, access the various wallets, because it's not unusual in these types of situations that effectively the digital assets have ended up in a, in a range or a handful of different wallets. If you can draw links between various people who are saying, I'm completely innocent, and actually other wallets, um, that can make a big difference. I'll give you a practical example on a case I was recently instructed in. We were able to uh, obtain information from the exchanges that indicated what device was used to access the wallets. And the device was a top of the range 13, series 13 iPhone. And what, what had happened was uh, wallet one was accessed by said iPhone. And two minutes later, the same iPhones used to access Wallet 2. Now, Wallet 1 and Wallet 2 purported to be entirely unconnected, no connection whatsoever, entirely innocent third parties. When presented with this information by my instructing solicitors, surprisingly, they played no further role in the proceedings and neglected to turn up, and we obtained um, judgment against both of them um, in circumstances where the link had been established between the fraudsters and where the wallets had ended up. So you will have an awful lot of people saying, I'm a, just an innocent third party. It's all anonymized and all the rest of it. The key question is, how did you end up with 80 Bitcoin that you know is linked to this particular fraud? And questions need to be asked. So um, what would be the benefits of sending a without prejudice letter? Yeah, so once you get everything, you, you need to, as I said, serve it on the defendants. And you have an open letter saying, here are all the documents and essentially deal with it, uh, and you're, we're going to get a return date, we're going to deal with this properly in court. You can have the opportunity um, to have your say. What I found is, is usually if you send a without prejudice letter along with it, you can come to a uh, commercial uh, resolution. So it may be that the client says to you, actually, I don't want protracted litigation or, or for this to run on. What I'd like is for you to put an offer in for 70% of the value or 60%, whatever it may be, just to be commercial. Um, and a lot of the time, these people end up settling. And the reason is, is they don't really want their name plastered all over 
legal documents, especially if they're in a, a, a criminal group. So this year, I, I was very lucky to sort of fly out to Cyprus and meet one of the guys who um, ended up with the funds. And it's just a good way to sort of legitimize the settlement proceedings. Right. And is it then best to seek settlement in fiat or in crypto? Um, yeah, it really depends, right? Because there's volatility in the market sometimes, and it may actually be that when Bitcoin was stolen from you or whatever asset, it's lowered in its value. Um, so it may well be, uh, it may be better to, to, to seek fiat. Um, it also depends on where you, how you're going to calculate the value of the fiat um, money, because it may be that it's dropped and, and you want to uh, look at the value of when it was stolen, uh, because it may have been greater then. Um, it also depends on whether the victim wants to hold crypto assets anymore. Maybe they've had enough. They've gone, you know what, I've had all my stuff stolen. I don't want this anymore. I just want pounds, euros, whatever. Um, again, it depends on what asset, has, what asset there is. Um, if it's uh, an asset that's collapsed, um, like Terra, which was supposed to be a stable coin, then maybe you want it in fiat. Um, it really depends on, on all of those factors. Okay. Let's move on to substantive uh, proceedings. Um, what are substantive proceedings against the individual defendants, i.e. those uh, who have the proceedings of the crime look like, and what are the claims? Yeah, okay, so it's important to note that everything we've discussed to date is about interim remedies before you actually get into substantive proceedings. Um, certainly an English court will require you to obtain an interim remedy to issue a substantive claim, and that's a costly process. Uh, the claim itself has a number of likely causes of action, uh, and each have their own specific advantages, um, both jurisdictionally, um, but also in terms of actually being the easiest route to a judgment. Uh, one area which is uh, quite common here is to plead, obviously, fraud. Uh, that's fraud by fraudulent uh, misrepresentation by the fraudsters. Um, to plead fraud, certainly under English law, and English judges tend to have a, a Victorian notion of, of fraud. To accuse someone of fraud is to um, accuse them of pretty much the most heinous thing going. So we as lawyers have quite strong obligations as regards uh, making sure there's an evidential foundation for that. But in a lot of these cases, that's not a particularly big difficulty. You will often find fraudsters effectively um, representing that they are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority or that they um, are able to justify the relevant returns that they are purporting to give to your client. Um, it is not unusual for the fraudsters to be discovered when they demand a payment on account of tax. And they effectively say, well, in order for, for me to release your crypto funds, you've made a, a withdrawal request. You need to um, put me in funds for, for a, you know, the equivalent of a million a million pounds or a million euros to, to pay the tax liability of all your gains and, and then we'll release uh, your digital assets. Um, the long and short of it is fraudulent misrepresentations, your primary um, pleading, but also other claims for uh, conspiracy, particularly when there are a whole range of different individuals who've been identified, uh, unjust enrichment or restitution. Uh, and there is an open question about whether you can plead something called conversion, which is effectively uh, theft of property uh, and at the moment the English Law Commission have released a consultation paper where they've indicated that in order to plead conversion there may need to be a change in the legislation uh, in England in order to do so in your own jurisdictions you may well have similar uh, types of um, cause of action and certainly anything in relation to what could be described as I suppose a tort or a delict uh, is something you need to be looking at as well but but certainly fraud is 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 your primary cause of action. Okay, Matt, I understand you were able to establish grounds for conspiracy in a case. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so conspiracy is more difficult because you have to prove a link between the person who defrauded your, your client and the, the people who ended up with the funds. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, a case that I worked on. Um, it was a guy who got defrauded by a company in the Marshall Islands. Um, what he did, he sat and watched an episode of, of Dragon's Den um, for those who know what that is. He was very excited that there was a Bitcoin company that he logged onto his Google account, Googled them, clicked on a link, but it wasn't a legitimate link, it was an illegitimate link. And he was set up with a profile, a trading profile, um, where he was able to exchange Bitcoin and gold and silver, or so he thought. Um, it turns out that he allowed um, half a million pounds to be taken from his HSBC account and transferred out of various exchanges that were set up in his name. 
A few months later, that's when we got involved and um, we were able to trace the funds as we've been describing. But one of the really sort of odd things about that was that he was determined on revenge. And revenge is not a good reason to litigate. However, he carried on talking to the individuals via WhatsApp, the guys who defrauded him. And they kept coming up with these new personalities. So they would say, oh, yes, it's me, Dave, your new uh, account manager. Please deposit your tax uh, money, $70,000 worth, to this new address. OK, well, we've got a new address now. Another one was we have to, uh, I think, again, it was another account manager to pay $50,000 in a fiat. So it was a Santander account in Spain. OK, well, we give the investigators that information as well. It got to the point, actually, where he was messaging them so much against our advice, because I would rather professionals deal with that, but he was messaging them so much, a guy came out of nowhere, uh, supposedly, uh, who had also been defrauded by this Marshall Island company, and said, I'm going to help you take them down, but I need some money for it. So, again, another wallet address was provided in which for him to make the payment, and against my wishes, he did. But it started to paint a picture of who these people were. We couldn't find a link between R1, the person who defrauded uh, the client, and the people at the end who ended up with the money. But using this information that they'd given up, all of a sudden we were able to paint a picture and start to, start to develop a conspiracy. So that's another head. So would you say it's sensible to, count, to continue to speak to sports or usually don't do that? Uh, yeah, I would have recommended not to before I did that case. Um, but it turns out that actually if you keep them on the side and wish them Merry Christmas and hope their father does well, uh, then they will be friendly to you, they will carry on communicating with you, and they will start to give stuff up, which is um, interesting. Okay, thanks for that. Let's move on to uh, enforcement and custody. Um, um, <coughs> you have an order saying the proceeds trace belong to your client. How do you enforce this? Yeah, okay. So if you haven't reached a settlement, which actually often occurs in these cases, um, because the costs of pursuing the claim all the way to, tr to trial may be significant. And likewise, as Matt has indicated, it may be sensible to make a, a pragmatic commercial offer to avoid the costs of that. Um, you ultimately are likely to want judgment, either by way of default judgment or summary judgment or judgment after a trial, against not only the fraudsters, but those who received the illicit and illegal funds. Um, you end up in a situation where you have a judgment from your own jurisdiction, uh, in our case that would be from the courts of England and Wales, and you're then looking to enforce that judgment in other jurisdictions, not just against the, the fraudsters, but critically in respect to the exchanges, where are the exchanges located. And if the exchanges have a registered English office in our case, well, then you have an English High Court order saying that you are entitled to the funds in that relevant wallet and they should be delivered up to you. If they don't have a base within the jurisdiction, there are a couple of ways to deal with this, one of which is by having an open dialogue with the exchange, who may be prepared in light of a judgment to um, transfer the digital assets to you. Unfortunately, there's often a transaction cost, but it is de minimis often compared to the amount that you're pursuing. Alternatively, um, there has been a recent judgment as of last week from the English High Court granting summary judgment to a victim of crypto fraud and ordering the exchange to hand over the contents of a wallet which the court considered were held on constructive trust for the claimant victim. That's quite a notable development and it's going to be interesting to see how that develops over the coming uh, months because there are a number of cases going through the courts involving exchanges. One of the big question marks is the liability of an exchange in the context of crypto uh, fraud and invariably the exchange is going to be the conduit for information to you but they also have the power to enable that judgment to have real teeth. Obviously there are going to be situations where uh, you are able to identify an individual and they may have assets, and then you would pursue your normal asset recovery mechanisms. One of the interesting things for this particular room and why this particular talk is relevant is how often cross-jurisdictional issues arise. And you're looking at cross-jurisdictional enforcement. I think you're going to be addressed on that on Wednesday by Gatam from Phoenix Legal, but the long and short of it is cross-jurisdictional enforcement of 
crypto asset judgments are going to be a, a real growth area over the next year or two. Okay, then finally, let's look at some uh, government initiatives. Um, where do you see the practical application for asset tracing and litigation involving blockchain generally? Yeah, I think Dara, and I'm very aware that a 10 minute sign was held up to us about 10 minutes ago, so I'll try and be quick. Um, but essentially, um, insurance, um, guys, th th there will be ransom payments made in the original case that uh, Dara and I did where uh, ransoms are paid in Bitcoin and they want to get those ransoms back um, as part of, part of uh, insolvency proceedings. Uh, maybe some of the assets as part of those are crypto or, or blockchain assets and therefore can be recovered. Uh, general fraud cases, as, um, as Dara alluded to, I saw one, it was a romance scam uh, conducted on supposedly uh, the world's safest romance website, um, which was a bit odd. Um, accidental loss, uh, divorce as well, where there's uh, digital assets during divorce proceedings. And uh, yeah, I've actually put insolvency twice, so it must be very, very important. Um, but that is probably it. I'm aware of time. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes, <laughs> Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm Dr. Mina Skander. Um, I've been handling, representing one of the biggest US-based companies dealing with digital assets. And I was handling their account in the Middle East and North Africa where I practice my work. Basically, we faced a lot of challenges uh, dealing with that uh, kind of dealings. Firstly, due to the lack of any laws regulating the digital assets in mostly all the countries in the Middle East, except Dubai. Secondly, um, we face a lot of challenges that um, usually the central banks regard the digital assets as fraud or money laundry, which is the basically the biggest challenge we've been facing. And of course, in that regard, I have a couple of questions. What, as lawyers, is the safe net for the customers dealing with the cryptocurrencies? That's a point. And the other point is, as lawyers, how do we provide our services to the cryptocurrencies uh, corporates versus the governments, because as I previously told you, we, cryptocurrencies um, companies are dealt with as a, a shield or as a shell companies for the money laundry and you know fraud stuff. Especially in the light of a lot of uh, fraud cases happened uh, in the couple of years ago. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'm, what normally happens is in in our cases is we act for um, individuals and private businesses and we hire um, private investigators using software like Chainalysis, um, and we present the findings to a court. So it's all done through a civil route. Um, so we avoid any need for really any governmental interference. So uh, it's unfortunate that there has been some sort of government intervention in, in, in your case, but we are trying to keep our practice strictly civil to make sure that we trace the uh, the money rather than the criminals or, or deal with any regulation and we just keep it within um, our own jurisdiction where we can until we get to enforcement. Um, so I, I, I suppose I, I'm asking sort of a follow-up question which is why, how, why are you dealing with governments? What, what's happening? Ah, okay, fine. Uh, yeah, and I actually met with a lot of central bank governors uh, trying to regulate this due to the lack of laws regulating the whole matter. But unfortunately, we had a lot of uh, meetings and collaborations to reach a settlement or an agreement so we can work under the auspices of the central bank. But basically, we didn't get any confirmations. And actually, we went even, I was selected as one of the panels regulating in Morocco, in the Central Bank of Morocco, as putting the basics of the law regulating the digital assets. But till this day, nothing is going further. And uh, as I told you. Yeah. I, I can maybe chip in a little bit. And I'm going to reference Peter here who may want to add to it. But what, what you've expressed is, is quite a common situation. And as I say, there's this regulatory 
gap at the moment, and that's really across the world. It's, it's not just a, a Middle Eastern and African issue, it's in Europe as well. Uh, one of the difficulties, I think, generally is regulators are trying to find their way and get up to speed in relation to this. And you are absolutely correct in relation to proof of funds, money laundering, AML issues, KYC information. That's all critically important. What can be relied upon potentially, depending on the level of sophistication of the corporate, but but the sense of things, if you're having direct dealings with um, the Moroccan Central Bank, etc., it's presumably quite a large corporate, is the fact that precisely for the reasons that we rely upon the likes of chain analysis to trace where the where the funds have come from, there are tools available, including chain analysis reactor, which show is there any affiliation with those particular assets on the blockchain with any ransomware attacks or otherwise. Notably, the US Treasury Department auctioned off crypto assets. And the reason they do so, and they're often sold just at par, is because effectively those seized assets, I think it has to be said that the US Department of Justice has been most successful at seizing crypto assets. They then auction those crypto assets with the imprimatur that these have been previously seized. Ergo, they are confirmed by the US government as being safe in relation to things. So one of the ways in which the actual funds themselves can be verified is by reference to some of the tools that are available. The other point is, of course, showing that there are very robust systems in place regarding KYC and AML. Um, undoubtedly, there are greater risks uh, in dealing with um, crypto business and the fact that your holdings are in crypto, uh, but the long and short of it is, it is just another asset type. And it is perfectly legitimate for a corporate to hold crypto assets. Uh, they don't have to be involved in fraud, and there may be very, very good reasons why they need to be involved in, in the crypto world, particularly if their product base is a fintech of any description. Um, I think, unfortunately, it is an ongoing discussion with regulators, regulators what I've found in those types of situations is that often corporates engage in regulatory arbitrage where they actually go to a different jurisdiction and say, listen, we've had chats, we've been approved and authorized in Cyprus, Greece, wherever it is, Malta, um, why won't you, the UK FCA, regulate us? It's all about a frank discussion. As regards your second question, which was to do with how do we as lawyers deal with the risk involved in that? Again, it's back to processes and making sure that your own KYC is up to scratch, uh, that you do uh, perform all regulatory checks that you need to do so in relation to the funds. Um, I know there are certain law firms in England that accept payment by way of crypto payments. Um, it may be the case that actually, if there are issues or you're concerned about the whereabouts of those funds, that may be a broader issue with the client. And likewise, there's always the option uh, of being paid by way of fiat currency in relation to this from a proof of proof of funds that you're satisfied with um, in terms of things. I think the reality is there are a lot, a lot of fraudulent operators in the crypto space, but not exclusively so. And though crypto fraud has jumped up, so has the use of the market itself. Uh, Tesla, et cetera, we can all think of well-known companies that are operating in this space. The other feature then as well is there are a whole range of well-regulated entities that are permitting trading through crypto platforms. There are listed exchanges, such as Coinbase, listed in, on NASDAQ, uh, and they have regulatory obligations in relation to that. So sometimes it's about anchoring that verification process from third-party countries, and that may be the way to do it, but it sounds like a very difficult situation you've been in. Thank you. Yeah. Doesn't seem like there are any further questions, so we're going to finish it there for lunch, I think. <laughs>